there's always this need to defend it and say it is of the day and that really annoys me because it is not of the day. Some say you only die when you're forgotten. The problem is tens of thousands of servicemen were. You were to have asked me at the beginning of the project, you know, you know what, what is it you expect to find? It wouldn't be what we published. I was shocked at the figures. Every little village in England has the names of all those who did not return. To realise that we'd missed so many people, it really was quite upsetting. They went there carrying curries into the trenches and died, you know. Okay, this happened 100 years ago for whatever reason. The most important thing was, what are you going to do now? The hardest part is knowing where to start. Okay, so this is our archive. My name is George Hay. I am the official historian at the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Dr Hay authored the report. He's now part of a tiny team of researchers assembled to begin the colossal task of finding thousands upon thousands who've been forgotten. And he thinks it's possible. If we're saying we're looking for what might be 350,000 names, if we put that into archival terms and you try and visualise that in, in a paper sense, um, it's, it's substantial. But we know now um, from, from recent research that um, probably the largest employer of military labour in East Africa, the Military Labour Bureau, Military Labour Corps, we know that they produced extensive card um, catalogues. We know that they had a ledger system in place during the war. Whether it survives, we don't yet know. But if it does survive, it probably survives in East Africa still, so possibly in Tanzania, possibly in Kenya. Um, if we can find that paperwork, then hopefully we can put some names to those who died. Dr Hay will work with research teams, museums and universities around the globe to try to find these forgotten individuals. Even where there is no magic list, there is still hope. Journalist Trebani Basu was also on the report committee. Most of these soldiers were illiterate peasants. They were just people who lived in the hills, who tended goats, and they were all recruited. Those families still live in those villages. You can, you know, fund research grants. There are so many researchers out there. The one thing India has is manpower, you know, universities near these areas. Send, do research projects, send these people to the villages because they're mainly oral histories. It wasn't just the soldiers, it wasn't just the combatants. You had these followers. So you had the cooks, the cleaners, the water carriers. You had young boys, as young as 10. They would going there just to knead the dough or just, you know, run carrying tea. And they then recorded with just their first names. Sometimes it's not even a name. One, you know, one name mentioned of the followers is Chotu. Chotu means, in Hindi, means somebody small. It's what you just, so we don't even know his name. It's not just the issue of pervasive racism, Dr. Hayes says. What's needed is a complete overhaul of our approach to world wars. I would hope that, that this work shifts some of the focus away from the Western Front. So that, that's not just um, in, in school curriculums, it's not just in, in sort of um, formalised teaching, but actually people's general interest. That's where I want us to be, just to say these are global wars, and they're not global wars because the world comes to Europe. You know, they're, they're world wars because they're fought across the world, and, and you know, this is a really good example of that. Um, but if you take the First World War in particular, um, I think a UK audience finds it really difficult to view that um, almost outside of um, you know, the Somme, and even the first day of the Somme, uh, and, and Passchendaele. If you take the Second World War, the most diverse contributions are not in Europe. So let's stop talking about D-Day, but let's talk about Burma. Let's talk about the two African divisions in Burma. Let's talk about the bulk of the Indian Army that fights in Burma. The first shots of the First World War are, are fired in Africa, and the armistice there takes place two weeks after the armistice in Europe. So the war is, if you like, beginning and ending there. Um, and that maybe reinforces this idea that you know, we need to think more 
about how we tell the story of, of the First World War. It's National War Graves Week, and at a cemetery in Surrey, people gather to learn the art of commemoration. We use one of these bases here, which is a, called a shoe, and then we use a sharp sand and cement mix that goes, and we wedge them either side to get them upright and perfectly in line. I mean, we're delighted that you've taken the time. Director General of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, Claire Horton, is here to oversee the activities. She says they have a plan. We've got a very detailed programme of works that we are finalising now. We are very unlikely to find all of those names, and I think that's simply because there just were no records kept, um, and so those names will never have existed on record. But there will be a lot of other people who we will find, and we will have names for. And for those people, we'll make sure that they're commemorated by name. And for those that we can't find, we will tell their stories. So we'll be talking to the local communities about what we need to do um, to make sure that they have their own history, that we're all clear about the sacrifice of those people that got lost. The reason that people don't know that Indians fought in the war, that the Africans came, is because it's not taught in the schools. It's not taught in the schools here, it's not taught in the schools in India. I didn't know about it and I grew up in India. I had no idea there were men in turbans fighting in the trenches. It is a, you know, something that needs to be corrected. Obviously, you can't pressurize the Indian government, but uh, you know, here, the UK government, I think it should be part of the syllabus. Um, I don't think these stories should come up only once a month, you know, for Black History Month in October. I think it should be regular. It's rare for historians to be able to sit down and say, you know, I'm doing something that feels relevant and important. Say, so, you know, I think all of my colleagues around the globe will now be screaming at me and saying how, how dare I make such a suggestion. Um, history is always important, um, but I think rarely does it have such relevance. And I think maybe, you know, I'm, I'm in a rare position to be able to say that, you know, I'm, I'm working on something that does and that feels brilliant in terms of um, pride um, and, and other, I guess, personal feelings about the project. I think, um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm excited, especially if we, if we can find what we want to find. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Brookwood Military Cemetery. It is daunting because it's a really big job to do, and it's a really important job. But it's, you know, this is the the Wargraves Commission. This is who we are, and this is what we do. So we, you know, 100 and 104 years, 150 countries, and 23,000 locations. Um, we commemorate all those people who fell, and that is what we'll continue to do. Our, our founding principle is about equity in death. It's about making sure that those people's memories are never lost, and we restate that today.